So we're excited to continue the evening with our featured speaker, Mark DiCarlo. Uh, Mark's a Chicago native. He's worked in television and movies for many years. For those of us with kids, you may recognize him as the voice of Jimmy Neutron's dad. His foodie credits include Travel Channel's Taste of America with Mark DiCarlo, as well as this book, A Fork on the Road. Please join me in a big food service welcome for Mark DiCarlo. Song. How's it going, everybody? You having a good meal? Everyone having a good time? Oh, it's good to be here. Good to be back home in Chicago. I want to welcome all of our vendors, all of our all-star chefs, and all the people in the kitchen scraping our plates. Good to be here. Tonight we're going to recognize your tireless work and commitment to hospitality and cuisine with our U.S. Food Service Vendor Awards. Now at USF, we've always uh, set ourselves apart by delivering great, intuitive, responsive customer service. And now with the addition of these 24 new exclusive brand items that are designed to make our customers' lives a little bit easier and our business more profitable, it seems like a good time to reflect on exactly what it is we all do and how we've learned to do it better. And perhaps most importantly, why the hell we've chosen to do a job that takes seven days a week, 24 hours a day, we could easily be doing something much more pleasurable and, and certainly uh, less time intensive. And of course, when I talk we, I'm talking about you. I'm, I'm just a comedian with a food show. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about the hospitality business, that term, hospitality business. It seems kind of like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Hospitality, it's that generous spirit, the our home is your home philosophy that you learn from your your family or your, or your parents, your friends, keeps your customers coming back happy and hungry. And then the other part, business. That's what you learn about from professors at MBA programs and culinary schools. It's how to parcel out exact portions of chicken so that your checks don't bounce at the end of the month. And it's seemingly the antithesis of hospitality. At least that's what I thought when I started doing my show, Taste of America, on the Travel Channel. I didn't really know much about the food business, although I had, I, I had been eating my entire life, so I was familiar with the food part. <laughs> During the show, I visited over 400 different chefs all around the country. It was an extended culinary road trip. My camera crew and I walked down on chefs in all 50 states in a weekly effort to celebrate uh, the special few restaurants and locations and, and resorts that really stood out above the rest and, and had some kind of regional specialty, something that made them different and made people want to go there. The, they were truly extraordinary. And along the way, I assumed I'd be eating some fabulous food, but what I didn't realize is that the juiciest tidbits I would gather on my tour would be the time spent with the foodies themselves, people like you, meeting a wide variety of successful owner-operators and learning that there is no one right way to run a restaurant. And most importantly, that no restaurant is an island. Every great joint survives and thrives because of a honeycomb of talented, dedicated people who all share a single focus, making the customer happy. Seems obvious, but sometimes it needs to be said. Luckily for me and my publisher, there are still genuine characters around the country keeping alive a dizzying array of regional variation, uh, not only on the menu, but in the dining experience itself. If you're having breakfast in Macon, Georgia, it's different than having breakfast in Austin, Texas, or in Maui, Hawaii. Thank God there are still different places around the country where you can feel different, taste different foods, and, and really experience the different little pockets of culture here in America that still exist. After meeting so many funny and interesting and just plain weird chefs and <laughs> owner-operators, I decided to collect my favorite stories into a book. And then to try and fit them all into one successful hospitality business profile, and maybe boil it all down into a restaurant code of a few culinary commandments. But that's impossible. I wasn't able to do that. There are too many recipes for restaurant success. There's as many as there are good restaurants. But over the five years that we did the show, I did learn a few things that some of the best restaurateurs do have in common. The first thing is, you got to know your customers. Sounds simple, but it's important. You got to mix, you got to mingle, you have to listen to what your customers say. It's the only way to really know what they think of your place and your menu. 
and make sure that they know that no matter what, you will do whatever it takes to satisfy them. Killer and his mom, Martha Lou, run Martha Lou's Soul Food Kitchen outside of Charleston, South Carolina. Where's the chilling people, Killer? Big Daddy, if they come, they come. When it don't come, you know they're not coming. But when it do come, they want to come. He's the Yogi Berra of the South. There you go, Big Daddy. Check it out, make sure you like what you see. See if you like, no, you even want to watch out. I thought I was Big Daddy. <laughs> you still Big Daddy. Well, we yeah. can't run. We can't both be Big Daddy. Daddy. Yeah, well, he's Big Daddy, too. He's not Big Daddy. Wait, yeah. there, you know, there's three Big Daddies? You can have all the Big Daddies you want. Can I be Biggest Daddy? Nice. Yeah, you can. See, he thought for a second. He took a moment. He just didn't want to placate me. He thought and said, yes, of course, you could be Biggest Daddy. He's giving the customer what they want. And what he's really talking about I think, I'm not sure, but is his own customer loyalty program. If you play that tape back very slowly, you'll know that what he's really saying is, please check your order and make sure I've filled it correctly, and if perchance I've made a mistake, I will not charge you. I will also guarantee your total satisfaction. He just says it in a Charleston, South Carolina way, which is beautiful and music to my ears. We were there to make Martha Lou's famous boiled chitlins. People know what chitlins are? Yeah. Yeah. They smell, the boiled ones smell and taste like crap. There's really no other way to say it. <laughs> I could expound on that, but we're, this is not the time or the place. Horrible, awful chitlins. Every Wednesday, at least 50 people, regular customers, show up to eat them. Some of them driving 70 miles round trip. And we're talking about boiled hog intestine, vegetables, biscuits, and cornbread. It, it smelled awful, like you would imagine boiled intestines would smell. But these folks were eating, eating it up, literally. And I didn't understand it. I mean, I've had fried, you know, deep fried chitlins, and those are okay. But the boiled ones, I, I, I didn't understand why people were coming from all over the place on Wednesdays to have this lunch. So I started talking to people. The customers in the restaurant asked him, what are you doing here? And nobody said anything about the food. It's almost like they didn't even really like the food, but they kept coming back to Martha Lou's for that experience. They came because the chitlins reminded them of growing up, you know, their grandmother's Sunday cooking, and they returned like swallows to a funky smelling Capistrano. <laughs> they, they came back every week to get a little taste of that sepia-colored past that they remembered. You know, it's, it's Martha Lou's on Wednesday tapped into the deep vein of what we call comfort food. Even though the resulting gas and agit on the way home is anything but comfortable, <laughs> people showed up and they ate it and they, and they said they liked it. See, Martha Lou and Killer instinctively understand that what they're serving, because they're out there talking to people. They're talking to their customers and they know what they want. They're getting their feedback and, and listening to it. They're able to merge the cold, hard business end of making a living with the hospitality needed to turn a leaning, crappy, clapboard building into a Taj Mahal of cuisine. They understand what they're doing. That's your customers. Another big thing that I'm sure you all understand is quality ingredients. It seems simple, but y you can't make good food unless you start with good food. And as vendors, you understand that. Quality ingredients pay for themselves in customer loyalty and word of mouth. Our ever-increasing roster of uh, exclusive brands combined with our customer service forms a true partnership between you folks and the owner-operators that are out there running restaurants. And you give them lots of help. You're designing menus, you're offering new recipes, creating workable solutions to nagging problems that help struggling restaurants stop struggling and become robust customers. It's good business, but it's also hospitable. You're helping out a partner. Most owner-operators only know one thing. They know how to run their joint. Without the perspective of having worked with and in hundreds of stores, sometimes it's difficult to see the solutions to seemingly unique problems. They think they're the only ones in the world that are having this problem. And U.S. Food Service is uniquely positioned to share our expertise and experience in this industry, showing 
owners that not only are their problems not unique, but they're fixable. Gus runs a diner outside of Philadelphia, and he is famous for his hot sauce. Let me see you know. I thought he was going to kill me. Delicious. I would have done it on my own, but he insisted that he helped me because he's Greek, and that's how the Greeks are. They invented everything. Gus invented that diner. Every morning at 6 a.m., Gus and his son, little Gus, exactly, <laughs> they personally meet the delivery truck and approve each piece of produce. They make giant sandwiches, they make omelets, and they make their own hot sauce. Gus peels the peppers, he simmers them in vinegar and spices and chilies and bottles his own blazing hot, yet really tasty, fire sauce that's famous all up and down the eastern seaboard. Now, would it be easier for Gus to buy Tabasco or Red Rooster from you guys? Of course. But Gus wants it Gus's way. It's his father's recipe. He brought it over from Greece, and God help you if you even suggest that it's not the best hot sauce in the world. The Greeks invented it. We invent the hot sauce. But see, a salesman not only understands that, but relishes Gus's commitment and becomes a partner for Gus, streamlining his work and keeping his table filled, which, of course, keeps the sales books filled as well. Probably the most important thing I learned visiting all these chefs in every corner of the country is just be yourself. You know, th there's tons of characters, and, and they excel in the food world. It's really an entertainment business. Customers love passion. They eat it up. Passion for food and the people who will be eating it, I, I think that's an, an, an essential ingredient to making a good place into a great place. I just came from western New York. I was in Buffalo, New York for Labor Day, and I was with my buddy Drew Serza, the wing king. Every Labor Day, Drew holds the National Buffalo Wing Festival. This was the 10th anniversary of that festival, because 10 years ago, Drew was watching, for some reason, Osmosis Jones, a really bad Bill Murray movie, one of his few bad ones. And in the movie, the characters were going to go to the Buffalo Wing Festival. And Drew sells buffalo wings in western New York. And there was no Buffalo Wing Festival, so he said, you know what? I'm going to make a Buffalo Wing Festival. <laughs> and he did. 10 years later, they've sold 1.5 tons of buffalo wings at this festival. They have a buffalo wing eating contest that's all over the news. And my favorite part is the blue cheese bowl bobbing for wings. <laughs> Put this on your bucket list, people. Is there anybody here from Western New York that's actually been to this festival? No? I'll explain it to you. They fill the kiddie pool with 100 gallons of blue cheese dressing. It's 100 degrees. And they fill it, I think, a little too early in the day, but they do it. <laughs> it sits there in the sun. Then they get three idiots who want to compete in a bobbing for wings competition. They're instructed to put their hands behind their back. They kneel in front of the kiddie pool. Drew dumps a bunch of buffalo wings into the sauce, where they're now hidden beneath the milky white goo of the salad dressing. And then, like Labradors on a bone, they <laughs> blow the whistle and <laughs> they're rooting around for the buffalo wings in the kiddie pool. It's grand entertainment. It really, really makes you feel good about the future of this country, that college kids are willing to do this competition. For a scholarship? No. For a big check? No. For a t-shirt? A t-shirt that just says Buffalo Wing. What it should say is, I'm the idiot who won the Bobbing for Wings competition. But Drew Serza walks around the baseball field all weekend long in a giant foam Buffalo Wing hat with a cape and a scepter, and he's the Wing King, <laughs> celebrating the beauty of Buffalo Wings in his home city, and he's in his element. He's a character. You can't go anywhere in Buffalo even when he's not in costume, without people going, hey, Drew, hey, Drew. He's like a prince in his own little buffalo wing fiefdom. He's a character. He's hilarious. And seriously, if you ever get the chance, if you're in Buffalo on Labor Day, go to the festival and win yourself a t-shirt. <laughs> it's a great t-shirt.
I've got it in my room right now. All different people, all different parts of the country, yet they all share one thing, individuality and hospitality. All right, well, that's two things, whatever. Hospitality. It's the reason, in my opinion, again, I'm not a trained chef, but I've been around enough of them to see that hospitality is why restaurant people are restaurant people. Think about your clients. Think about the people you know in the food service industry. They're gregarious people. People. They like being around people. They like feeding people. Because let's face it, they're more profitable businesses. They're easier businesses. But I don't think that there's a better people business. You know, we are what we eat. And, and restaurateurs, from pickles to fine dining, they provide sustenance for people. Intellectual, physical, camaraderie. It's more than just the food. I think it's the experience of walking into a welcoming environment, being catered to, enjoying an experience with your friends or family. It nourishes the body and the soul. And I would imagine in your jobs, in the day-to-day -day grind to you know, make a living and work, maybe sometimes it's easy to lose sight of that service that you're providing to society, that hospitality. Because really, I think it's that feeling. That's what we're selling, the comfort, the excellence, the delicious meals that always taste just a little bit different than they would if you were eating in your own house. The whole experience of dining out, that's what we're all selling. Our vendors, our chefs, our salespeople, we're in the business of being hospitable to strangers for money. That's the business part. That's the oxymoron part. And when we do that right, when, when, when the people and the ambiance and the ingredients all come together, like they did in this room last night. We had 30 chefs from all around the country, many guys who hadn't even met each other before yesterday. They got together with a whole raft of new ingredients and, and they combined to make delicious new recipes. Boom, it was like magic in this room. It was a, a transcendent moment having all those people creatively working in the back and then presenting their food to strangers. I always like to watch the chef when someone eats their food, when someone tastes their food, it's the face. <laughs> There's such unrestrained joy seeing another human being enjoying something that you've made with your hands and that you know is good, but it's nice to get that little extra pat on the back or the pat on the stomach. It's, it's, it's a great feeling and it's magical. And I think as consumers, it transports people out of our ordinary, if only for a few hours, into a world where everything is delicious and anything is possible. I don't, it's an alchemy that I don't think it can be faked. And it can't be accomplished alone. The only way to make a viable business of hospitality is to put, uh, put together a great team to lean on. Servers, chefs, staff, they're the cogs that the customer sees. But I think what they don't see is just as important. What do all you guys do? Getting the groceries from the field to the kitchens fresh and on budget, that's the hard part. That's the part nobody sees, but it's the partnership that makes everything else possible. That partnership makes the experience that our customers are paying for worth paying for. And I think that's hospitality. And that's what U.S. Food Service is really selling. Hospitality. And it would be a, impossible for us to accomplish that magic without you folks, our valued vendor. So, for all of our satiated customers around the country, all the regulars, all the folks who only dine out for special occasions, and all the other business people closing deals and forging friendships, much like we're doing here tonight, thank you for caring enough to do it and to do it right. I don't think there's anything more that needs to be said. Good night. Thank you.